Oh my god, I'm chills. What happened? Oh my god. Oh, I just can't. What? Hey everyone. Hey everyone. What Rice up? up here. What up? Thanks for joining. Nothing like a murder to decompress on a Sunday night. You know what I mean? Oh, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm screaming from the rooftops. And this is a crazy one. Okay, let's get going with it. I'm amped. I am. I'm going to get into it because it's kind of a doozy. I build up the characters is all I'm saying. So I go into a little more background than I typically would, but I just think it's important to understand the, okay. the severity of the situation. All right, Rach, we'll get going already. All right, let's do it. All right, remember Patreon shout outs and custom shout outs are coming at the end of each episode from now on. So without further ado, sources, the book Bitter Blood by Jerry Bledsoe. That was 90% of my sources. I actually read it. Oh, wow. You read it quick then. I know. Well, I, I talk about a deep dive. He's going into like, ancestors what they did so i skipped a couple of the first chapters but sure very very detailed very good an article on independent tribune and greensboro.com oh okay greensboro north north carolina yeah oh so, wow okay yeah somewhat local to me mm -hmm. well just north carolina you get it and i should tell y'all that i'm telling you about Susie newsom lynch and fritz klinner okay Susie Newsom was born on Christmas Eve in 1946 in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, to parents Florence and Bob Newsom. They were a very prominent family. Her dad was an executive at R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company, which is the second largest tobacco company in the U.S. even today. Yeah. Her aunt Susie Sharp, who she was named after, was the first female chief justice on the North Carolina Supreme Court. Wow. Badass. So okay. well to do, to yeah. say the least. Yeah, this is a powerful family, sure. Yeah. When Susie was three, Florence and Bob had her baby brother, Rob. Susie grew up to be sort of a spoiled brat. Okay. Her father, Bob, let her do pretty much whatever she wanted. Her mom was a disciplinarian. Sometimes when she was told no to something, Susie would throw tantrums so bad that her mom would have to put her in a cold shower to calm her down. <sighs> oh, my God. I would love an example. Also, <laughs> I mean, just losing her mind. Actually, but, but like over what core. is what I would love an example of. Oh, uh, yeah. Anything. Oh, my God. So reminiscent of Rach at 14. Okay. No, not 14. Like a toddler. That's why I said I feel this to my core. I have a four and a three-year-old. I'm like, does that uh, work? Cold shower, you say? Yeah, right. They would lose their minds. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Seems a little extreme. I know. I don't know why I was a... Uh... She, she wasn't a teenager and she was doing that. If you put a toddler in a cold shower, that would make them just scream louder and I mean, shriekier. Ugh. Yeah, I can't imagine. that. I can't imagine that would work. That's, that's why I was envisioning a teen. No. They were members at Forsyth Country Club, and Bob and Florence raised Rob and Susie with an emphasis on social position. They were taught the importance of doing what was expected of them and not deviating from the norm, oh which God. is all very interesting given where this is going. Oh, no, it's not. I could have called it from a million miles away. No, where the story is going. Oh, I mean, I know, but I imagine one of them um, rebels or two of <laughs> both of them. Rob and Susie were also very aware of their less affluent friends. Oh, Rob, which Rob had friends, but Susie grew up sort of isolating herself because she viewed herself and their family as special. And she started developing a fascination maybe even an obsession with the royal family. Holy shit. She isolated herself because she thought she was better than everyone. Yeah. For <laughs> somewhat. She had friends. She did have friends. But like, yeah, she, she was very, in her head. She, they were much better than everyone else. Being her friend sounds exhausting. I know. Um, so yeah, she, she became pretty fascinated with the royal family. She had books about them. Her bedroom wall was covered with pictures of them. While most girls her age probably had pictures of Elvis. She had pictures of Queen Elizabeth. <laughs> she would even wear formal dresses on the Queen's birthday. She is so <laughs> obnoxious. Mm -hmm. This fascination- As an well. adult? Or, sorry. No, no, no. Oh, okay. Yeah, you but, said that growing up. Sorry. 
No, that's okay. Because it did go in, well into high school. And a lot of her classmates thought she may have thought that she was royalty. Like I'm they thinking, couldn't see. They're like, it's yeah. beyond a fascination. Like you actually think this. <gasps> Needless to say, a lot of people thought she was a snob. But her best friend, Linda, later said that she was just misunderstood because she was gorgeous from a very well-to-do family and didn't have the same interests as other high school girls. She liked classical music and reading. She didn't have interest in boys or rock and roll or driving movies, as Linda said. Very, <laughs> very 50s, 60s mm -hmm. era, things you'd be into. Right. She also loathed hippies and strongly supported the Vietnam War. I have no doubt. Very unlike the flower children yeah. among her. Right. In 1964, Susie graduated from high school and went to Queens College in Charlotte, North Carolina, obviously, because Queens. Please tell me that was not actually the reason. <laughs> I don't know the actual reason, but she liked it at first. Oh, mm, my God. So that's why she went there. And it probably had a little bit to do with it. So she liked it at first, but felt like the other people there were frivolous and only cared about things like clothes and their hair. And she wanted a more serious atmosphere, so she transferred to Wake Forest College back home in Winston-Salem. Now it's Wake Forest University, but back then it was college. Don't at me. Just waiting for a slew of corrections. Oh, uh, yeah. At, at this time, it was Wake Forest College. Interesting. Okay. One day she was at the library studying and struck up a conversation with a freshman named Tom Lynch. Tom was pre-med from Chicago, and he was on the basketball team at Wake Forest. Susie and Tom started dating, but her family was not impressed. Tom was very quiet. He was two years younger than she was. And they said he seemed like his, quote, nice stable boy, which is <gasps> hilarious. Translation, poor. Uh-huh. But they weren't poor. They were very well off. I guess just not as well off as the Newsom family. Oh, my God. This is so obnoxious. Um, if he were on their level, he they would write everything else off. doesn't matter that he's two years younger. It uh, doesn't yeah. matter that he's quiet. This right. is... I hate this family so far. They hoped this relationship would come and go, but Susie was in love and they'd have to get over it. In 1969, Tom brought Susie home to meet his parents, Chuck and Dolores Lynch, and his sister Janie. By this point, the Lynch family had moved from Chicago to Louisville, Kentucky. So they yeah. go home to Louisville. Mm -hmm. The weekend meeting, Susie did not go well. Oof. Tom's mom, Dolores, was especially not a fan. She thought Susie was a snob and pretentious and thought she was better than their family, which, again, the Lynch family is just fine. I'm they sure. well off. Right. The feeling was mutual. Susie didn't like Tom's mom, Dolores, either, saying she was very overbearing. A lot of Dolores' friends also said that Dolores was a very no-one's-good-enough-for-my-son type, which, mm. reading this book, there's some validity to that, for okay. sure. But this didn't put a damper on Susie and Tom's relationship because... Later that year, they got engaged. Dolores was pissed. Oh, she God. made it very clear to Tom that she did not want them to get married. She asked him over and over if he was sure. She's oh, like, yikes. Ruining us. She does have a pretty good read on Susie, I gotta say. Mm -hmm. Well, he was sure because they got married in Winston-Salem on June 6, 1970, right after Tom graduated from school. The wedding was a big to-do, very formal. Tom's sister, Janie, was a bridesmaid. Susie's brother, Rob, was an usher. More drama between the Newsom and Lynch families ensued on the wedding weekend. Susie said Dolores, his mom, got too drunk at the rehearsal dinner, embarrassed her. She also got pissed at Tom's sister, Janie, because her bridesmaid's dress was wrinkled. The day of the wedding, Dolores was still nudging Tom, saying, it's not too late to back out. <laughs> it's not too late to change your mind. Like, That's really? Very uncomfortable, Mom. Very uncomfortable. <laughs> Right after the wedding, Tom and Susie moved to Lexington, Kentucky, where Tom was starting dental school at the University of Kentucky. He decided to be a dentist at this point. FYI, he ditched med school. Mm -hmm. He graduated dental school and joined the Navy so he could save up money and start his own dental practice. So when he joined the Navy, they signed him to Paris Island. So in 1974, Tom and Susie moved to Beaufort, South Carolina. Okay. Cute. I know. Very cute. Mm-hmm. That same year, 1974, Susie got pregnant, and on August 30th, she gave birth to a baby boy named John. Aw, that's my son's birthday. Y'all don't oh, care. Yeah, it is. I was thinking I said 13. I was like, what? No, it is. You're right. When he was born, Tom's mom and sister, Dolores and Janie again, there are a lot of players in the story, so I'm going to keep kind of reminding everyone who's mm -hmm. who. Please. Hopefully that helps. I don't want to cause confusion, but there are a lot of people in and out of the story. 
Okay. Yeah. Please keep so, in mind me. It's Sunday night. I'm very foggy. Mm-hmm. So John was born and Tom's mom and sister, Dolores and Janie, drove from Kentucky to meet the new little baby and Susie was pissed. Apparently they called saying they were in town and Susie was like, oh no, we have plans. You can come over tomorrow. So they did and the tension was thick. Susie didn't talk to them. They felt very unwelcome. So they left after a couple of hours and Dolores cried the entire way home. That is sad. However, I think I would be pissed too, if I'm being being honest here. My next sentence is, I will say, Dolores did seem a little overbearing. There are several examples of this where she'd start making her way on this road trip to see them and stop Mm -hmm. along the way saying like, "I'll, I'll be there tonight. I'm on my way or I'll be there first thing tomorrow or whatever. I would not like that either. No, I wouldn't no, either. No. Especially no, with a newborn. Screw yeah. that. I'm like, no, come on, man. No surprise visits. No, no, thank, no you. thank you. So that one, I'm like, mm, I'm going to go with Suze on this one. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to give it to her. Yeah. Ultimately, Susie just started refusing to go visit Tom's parents and would not let them come see, come visit them. It just, they just loathed each other. Oh, God. Okay. Mm -hmm. In 1976, Susie had their second son, Jim. Around the same time, Tom was discharged from the Navy and was ready to start his own practice. He had always dreamed of living out West and made some connections at dental school with people from Albuquerque. So he decided to pack up the family and head to New Mexico. Jeez. Okay. Susie hated Albuquerque. I bet because no one gave a damn. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> who she was or what money she came from. Yeah, I get there. But yeah, she said there were too many rough looking people there. It had no culture. Oh God. She called the museums pathetic. <laughs> Realistically, she was cranky because she wasn't known there. Her prominent family in North Carolina didn't mean shit in New Mexico. Right. Nobody cared. Right. No one cared. Mm-hmm. She said a few other racist things, but we can leave them. I so far constantly picture her in a KKK sheet. So we get to the KKK later. No way. Are you serious? Nope. Yeah, I'm dead serious. Oh, God. We'll get there. Uh, but yeah, she was, she thought there were too many, she said, there were too many Indians, too many Mexicans, and no culture. I'm like, that's okay. <laughs> oh, my God. So there's I an abundance of culture. Her. That's, yeah. Which is hilarious. <laughs> that is hilarious. I mean, in an obviously not hilarious way, people, please. Of course. Know we know that. It's Hilarious how stupid Stupid and dense she is. is. By their third year there, Susie was really over it. I can't believe she lasted three years, to be honest. Yeah, wow. Even more, actually. She resented Tom for moving them there. They were fighting a lot. His practice was growing, but it was very slow. So they were having somewhat money problems. She ended up getting a job. And as a little side project, she started learning Mandarin. Oh, wow. She always had a fascination with Chinese culture and thought anyone who could speak any form of Chinese had a bright future. So she went for it. Get it. Tom was hoping this would make her happier, but it didn't. She was miserable. In 1979, Susie's grandfather had a stroke, so she took the boys back to North Carolina to visit them. And one week into their visit, she called Tom saying, we're not coming back. Oh, my God. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say I have a feeling she would be so hard to please. Poor Tom. I know. She's miserable. I'm like, I'm sure she is. At letting all. you know it. Yeah. I bet, yeah. But yeah. she's a tough broad to please. Yes. She told friends that Tom just wasn't the same person she married. He had started taking medication for high blood pressure, and she thought that had something to do with it. They proceeded with the divorce, and Tom's mom, Dolores, is amped. amped. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Let's break out the good china. Let's cl- cloud cl- some nine. champagne. Cloud nine. With that... She started taking yet another one of her road trips for a surprise visit. <laughs> and when she got there, <laughs> she did. Dolores doesn't. <laughs> All right. She can't read a situation, can no. she? She can read people because she pegged Susie the moment they met. But, yeah. dude. Yeah. So, surprise. I'm here. Congrats on the divorce. Finally, you listen. But when she got there, she was very upset to see Tom's dental assistant, Kathy, at the house. Uh Uh-oh. Tom and Kathy had gotten close during the marital issues. I don't think he ever cheated, but Mm. when when he and Susie broke up, they started dating. Okay. Back in North Carolina, Susie found someone new to tutor her in Mandarin, but apparently becoming fluent in Mandarin that way was taking too long. She needed to be there to learn it quickly. Oh, Jesus. 
In late 1979, Tom called her to schedule time for the boys to come visit him for Christmas. And Susie said, no, they can't because we're moving to Taiwan. Oh, my God. Everyone tried to talk her out of it. She had barely been out of North Carolina. She hated New Mexico. Right. I was just thinking that. She was going to loathe living in a third world country, which it was at this time. Now it's mm-hmm. developed and fine, but not then. Well, maybe but, she needs a little culture shock. Maybe it'll, it'll do her some good. It does not. <laughs> oh, bummer. Plus, John and Jim were happy in North Carolina getting to spend time with their grandparents, but didn't matter. Right after Christmas, 1979, off they went. Selfish. They lived in a small apartment where they all shared a bedroom. As you can imagine, Taiwan was a tough transition. Uh, Yeah. It was heavily polluted, and Susie said she couldn't stand the filth. They were getting sick a lot. Jim, the youngest boy, got pneumonia twice. Oh, God. She wrote letters home saying that she thought the government was watching her. It was just bizarre. Oh, shit. But she, like, everywhere they went, they stuck out like a sore thumb. Americans did not live over there. So just, yeah. they would walk down the street and she said everyone was just staring at them. So it just, I guess, got in her head. She thought the government was watching her. Mm. So after about six months, she said, do y'all want to go home? And the boys were like, obviously. Fuck this yes, mom. Very irresponsible and impulsive. What are we doing? Yeah. You're not Ooh. thinking things through, I'm afraid. Right. Mom. So they go home and move back in with her parents, Bob and Florence. Mm-hmm. When they moved back, Susie's family was very concerned with how bad she looked. She was haggard, very skinny. They're worried she may have gotten some sort of illness in Taiwan, and they urged her to go see Dr. Fred Klinner in Reedsville, North Carolina. Dr. Fred Klinner was a very well-known doctor who believed that high doses of vitamin C, which he delivered intravenously, could stop pretty much any disease, any virus, anything. Measles, shot of vitamin C. Pneumonia, shot of vitamin C. Polio, shot of the VC. Premature babies, y'all roll up your sleeves too. (gasps) You're getting injected with vitamin C. Premature babies. Oh my God. Some people thought he was a quack. Others thought he was genius. Either way, very well-known doctor is the point. So in 1980, Susie went to Dr. Klinner after Taiwan and he diagnosed her with multiple sclerosis. But that's Mm. okay. It was early (laughs) on. Vitamin C, we have some OJ right here. (laughs) Not a problem. It was early on and he can cure it. So she started making the hour-ish drive to Reedsville every week to get her vitamin C drip. The vitamin C seemingly worked for Susie. She felt better. Most think she really, she never really had MS. It, mm-hmm. She was just tired and stressed, and the yeah. vitamin C put a little pep in her step. Who knows? God. So we could survive anything. Okay. I mean, look what they used to do. <laughs> like anything that I'm like, oh, that might not be good for me. I'm like, you know what? Fuck it. Yeah, definitely doing better than we were back then. While getting her treatments, she struck up a relationship with Dr. Klinner's son, Fritz Klinner, who helped him at at his clinic. Mm -hmm. Fritz was six years younger than Susie and getting ready to graduate from med school at Duke. He was also going through a divorce, so they got very close. And soon he was visiting her frequently and eventually it became romantic. But Susie's mom, Florence, strongly opposed it. Oh, why? Because he's six years younger? We'll get there. But a soon-to-be doctor about to graduate from Duke, perfect for a prominent family. Yeah. You can tell the gals of the country club. Uh Uh-huh. What's the problem? Right. Yeah. Well, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Fritz and his dad, Fred Klinner. Okay. They were conspiracy theorists, had an obsession with guns, prepping for the end of the world, paranoid, everything, the the whole nine. Once Fred Klinner found unusual footprints on their property, made plaster impressions of them, and mailed them off to the Smithsonian so they could confirm that it was Bigfoot. (gasps) Oh, <gasps> wow. Well, Susie thinks the government's watching her. This kind of seems, it's the perfect match. I know. Fritz, the, the son, had a fascination with Hitler and not in the I'm interested in history type of way. Uh-huh. He drew swastikas on his notebook in school. In ninth grade, he wrote in his friend's yearbook, be a man, join the Klan. <gasps> okay. Like, See, again, this seems right in line with Susie and her family. So I don't get it. Yeah. Can you imagine? Right next to, have a great summer. <laughs> too, too, <laughs> too cool, cool to, be to be forgotten. forgotten. Be a be man, a man and join, join the, the clan. clan. Wow. So, all right, I'm going to cross this out before I get anyone else to sign my yearbook. <laughs> right. This is Please. completely uncomfortable and inappropriate. Yeah. In 1970, he went on to study at Ole Miss. Hey. Hey. 
One reason his dad encouraged him to go to Ole Miss was oh, because shit. he was impressed by the stance Ole Miss took against James Meredith. <gasps> okay. Okay. If you don't know, especially for the people outside of the U.S., if you don't know, James Meredith was the first black student at Ole Miss in 1962. He had to be assisted by federal troops. There were riots. It was mm -hmm. very violent. Google it. It is not something to be impressed by. No. You it's... go there in spite of that. Right. You don't go there because of that. No. Ooh, it was not good. Good God. It is the most the shameful part of Ole Miss. Yeah, the Clinners loved it. I'm sure they did. The plan was for Fritz to go to Ole Miss undergrad, then Duke Medical School. He ultimately failed out of Ole Miss, but that's okay. He went home and told his family he graduated. Did he take his vitamin C? <laughs> nope. <laughs> Clearly mm. not because he failed. Mm. Bummer. When the diploma never showed up, his dad called the university and said, hey, send the diploma. And they were all, what diploma? Your dipshit son didn't graduate. And Fred was like, Fritz, you told us you graduated. And Fritz explained that there was a conspiracy, I believe in the German department at Ole Miss, that were working against him to prevent him to, from graduating. Oh, my God. These two are marrying each other? No, not yet. They've just met. Or oh, they're just romantic. dating at this point. Yeah, but I'm, I'm, just giving all, okay. I'm just giving y'all a little background into Fritz and Fred. I know. I'm sorry. Susie and Fritz met after this all happened. I'm just giving sure, sure. Time. I know. But I can see where it's going. They're going to get married and they're two loonies. Yeah. So he said there's a conspiracy working against him that prevented him from graduating. But don't worry, Dad. I'm working it out. I'm sorting it out. And Fred is a conspiracy theorist. So he was like, those assholes, good for you, work it out. Oh, my God. There was so no I'll, rational person in the story yet. Mm, no, there is. Oh, my God. So while Fritz was pretending to sort that out, he started working in his dad's doctor's office as an unlicensed medical assistant. In sure. 1976, Fritz announced yet again, hey, I graduated from Ole Miss and I got into Duke Med School. I guess this time his dad, Fred, just took his word for it because he was amped, very proud of his son. I needn't tell you that that is absolutely false. He did not graduate from Ole Miss, let alone enroll in Duke Medical School. Right. I'm just telling you that. Okay. That's not the twist. <laughs> no, I saw it coming from a mile away, so I knew that. So Fritz pretended to go to med school at Duke during the week, and on sure. weekends he'd come back to Reedsville to help his dad's in his dad's practice. Okay. He kept up the front for years, but eventually people started kind of guessing that he wasn't really a doctor. Once, for example, oh someone had a heart attack while Fritz was, the, was at the practice by himself, and Fritz ran up the street to a nearby dentist's office to get help, and a dentist ran back to administer CPR. Oh, my and God. That's people, some people, like, just on looking were like, hmm, you don't even know CPR You're in right. med school. That his friend said in the book, his friend said, that's when I thought to myself, that son of a bitch ain't no doctor. <laughs> Love it. Eventually, his family found out that he was not enrolled at Duke. But even with that, he continued to work in his dad's practice, providing medical care. And he and his dad still told patients that Fritz was, was at Duke. Telling patients oh that. God, Fred's a dipshit too. Right. He was like taking blood samples. He, he I mean, ooh. oh my God, that is horrifying. Right. So, and as time goes on, Fritz becomes more and more obsessed with guns, explosives, prepping. He starts collecting oh, cyanide. He's just on the brink. So that's a quick dive into Fred Klinner and his son, Fritz. But that doesn't even cover why Florence did not want Susie to be with him. Oh, shit. So what's the problem? In addition to all that, Fritz is Susie's first cousin. No. <laughs> oh, the my God. The whole reason she went to see Dr. Klinner at Clinter after Taiwan was because that's her uncle. Ew. So she sparked up a relationship with her first cousin, Fritz. Holy shit. This family's fault. Very taboo at the country club. Florence is oh, like, we yeah. cannot let people find out about this. No. Despite Florence's reservations, the relationship perseveres, and now we're in 1983. Oh, my God. Even though Susie won't admit that she and Fritz are lovers, Florence finds out from neighbors that while she and Bob went away for the weekend, Fritz was spending the night at the house, and this led to a huge fight between Florence and Susie. So Susie moved out. So they were dating, but they said, we're not having sex. Don't worry. N they, they never would admit they were dating. 
Uh, we like we now know that they were and having sex. But when her mom addressed it with her, she was like, no, we're just close now. Everyone, like the boys hinted that their uncle Fritz would come over after midnight. Everyone knew. Everyone was like, y'all are having sex. And they're like, no, we're not. We're just good, close cousins. And Florence, so, and, and Florence knew that that was bullshit. That's why she did not like it one bit. In Ew. addition, that's why she, she was like, that's why we never hung out with that family. They're crazy. Aside from this. Ew. Florence was also concerned that Susie was becoming mentally ill and consumed in Fritz's paranoid ide- ideologies. Mm-hmm. She was right, because yeah. soon Susie starts talking about how she believes Tom, her ex-husband and father of her children, was involved in some dark underworld of drugs and gambling. She said a family friend in the FBI told her that, but she would never say who. <laughs> how many family friends in the FBI do you have? Surely they can figure that out. Right. Then Fritz and Susie started suspecting that Tom was in the mob because his Partners of the dental practice had Italian last names. (laughs) Sure. I expect nothing more from this family. (laughs) Makes total sense. So now Fritz is on a mission to keep Susie and the boys safe from Tom, the monster, and Tom's family, especially his mom, Dolores, who Susie still talks about just loathes loathes her calls her the witch it's a mess even after the divorce yes way after she's still flapping her gums about it by spring of 1983 tom and kathy the dental hygienists were engaged and in june 1983 they got married Mm -hmm. right after the wedding john and jim came to albuquerque for their first summer visit i think that was part of the divorce arrangements is the two kids would start spending full summers and their spring break with their dad Mm mm-hmm When they got there, though, Tom was shocked to see how horrible they looked. Oh. They looked very sick, dirty. Their teeth had not been brushed. Their toenails were long and curling. They were very unkempt. He was very concerned. They also came with a huge bag of vitamins, huge doses that kids should not be taking. And they said their mom said they needed to take them every single day or else she'd be pissed. And Tom grabbed them, threw them away, and said, absolutely not. She won't know. She'll never know. Forget it. Oh, God. The boys also talked a lot about Uncle Fritz, which Tom thought was weird because he had only met Fritz a few times. It was the cousin no one really hung out with. So he was like, why is Susie all of a sudden spending all this time with them later to learn that they were kissing cousins? Ew. The boys also talked about Fritz's extensive gun collection, which included military weapons. Mm. Tom was like, I don't think... Y'all need to be around that. And Tom yeah. was a big hunter. He he loved guns, but he was like, well, no one needs those guns. Yeah. They told Tom that whenever Dolores, Tom's mom, sent them cookies or fudge, which she did every once in a while, Susie and Fritz would throw them out because they were likely poison. Poison. Mm-hmm. I saw that coming too. Yeah. Yeah. So Tom learned a lot about their setup in North Carolina and did not like it. No. The concern went both ways because Fritz and Susie hated that the boys had to spend all summer in New Mexico where they said Tom used them as a front to haul drugs across the Mexican border. Jesus. I mean, I overthink things. I get anxiety. (laughs) I can really convince myself of some stuff, but this is exhausting. I mean, beyond delusional. It would be exhausting. Exhausting. I mean, it's sad, sure. Because, like, clearly something's not right. But, my God. In May 1984, Dr. Fred Klinner... Fritz's dad died. He was 76 in terrible health. Vitamin C couldn't save him. He was out. (laughs) And if you thought Fritz was unhinged before, this really did him in. Fritz took over as the doctor in his dad's clinic. No. Friendly reminder, he did not go to med school. He did not finish undergrad. He saw patients, wrote prescriptions that were filled by local pharmacists who assumed he was a doctor. He was like, yeah, has a clinic. Oh, my God. His Aunt Susie, the badass chief, chief Justice. Oh, my God. I forgot about her. She became very suspicious and called mm-hmm. her friend, who's the president of Duke University, mm. and asked about Fritz's education, to which the president replied, who? What education? <laughs> the fuck's that, Susie? So finally, badass Aunt Chief Justice Susie had the clinic quietly shut down. Oh, wow. Did, okay. Didn't make a hoopla of it. They still have a family name to protect. But she was like, we're going to go ahead and lock these doors and turn off the lights. <laughs> and hide behind the counter. Yeah. Wow. That summer, the boys went back out to New Mexico for their scheduled visit with Tom and Kathy. 
And they took him on a little vacation to Purgatory Ski Resort, which is like four hours away from Albuquerque. When they got home Sunday night, Tom was surprised that Dolores hadn't called. That's her, his mom again. Uh -huh. She she called at least three times a week, but always, always when she knew that they were due home from a trip. It did not matter what time they were getting home. It could be the middle of the night. She was calling. Oh, shit. To make sure they got home. Not this time. By the way, th by this point, Tom's dad had died of a heart attack. So his mom, Dolores, lived alone. But his sister, Janie, lived nearby. So, oh, okay. so Janie and Dolores were together a lot. Okay. When Dolores didn't call Monday, they got uh -oh. back on a Sunday. She didn't call Monday, and Tom was like, that's weird, and said to himself, if he didn't hear from his mom by Tuesday night, he'd call her. But as call he Janie. Leaving, Get Janie's ass over there. As he was leaving work Tuesday afternoon, the police department chaplain walked in. Oh, shit. Both Dolores and Janie had been found murdered. <gasps> A friend of Dolores grew concerned when Dolores didn't show up for their weekly breakfast, so she drove to her house to find Dolores' body in the driveway. Oh, She had God. been shot. And Jenny was inside in a bedroom, also shot. Oh, my God. Tom was devastated. Mm -hmm. He called Susie to tell her the awful news and inform her that he'd be going to Louisville ASAP and the boys were going to be staying back in Albuquerque with Kathy for the week. Oh, God. She's not going to like that. He then called his attorney to tell him that he was the heir to the Lynch estate. His, now that his, both his parents and his sister were dead, it's all oh, him. God. Yeah. So he told his attorney if his plane to Louisville were to crash, the boys would get everything. And he wanted to make sure it was set up in a way that Susie could have no control over it through them. Smart. So before he got on his flight, his lawyer stayed up all night making sure that it was in that scenario, it would sit in a trust for John and Jim and could not be touched until they were adults. Smart. Okay. I mean, on it. On it. Like if that plane crashes, that I'm going to take off these headsets and go to bed. To find out your sister and mom are murdered and you go there and you're like, uh, I need to get other things organized because if I die now, she's going to have access to this through our young boys. Right. And when he knows in the back of her mind, she's something's not right and she may be responsible for this. So I just want to get my ducks in a row and make sure my boys are taken care of and my ex-wife and her new insane cousin husband are not. Right. So Do they get married? What I keep I keep pretending that Susie and her cousin are married, but I don't think you've said that yet. But I, I just keep referring to him as might as well. Might as well. We what's the damn difference at this point? There's fucking Ew! <laughs> Ew! <laughs> at this point. So luckily his plane did not crash. He goes to Kentucky, they have the funerals, and when he gets back to Albuquerque five days later, he calls Susie in tears, asking her if the boys can stay a little bit longer. Aww. His birthday was coming up, and he really just wanted to be with them during this tragic time. What does Susie say? No. She says, hell no, is what I'm nope. going to go with. with. With a quickness, she said, nope. This was the moment Tom decided he would use every dime of his inheritance, if he had to, in order to get those boys back, and decides that he's taking her back to court. Aww. Police start investigating Dolores and Janie's murder. They think it looks like a robbery gone wrong, but they also question Tom since he's now the sole heir to the estate. Susie and Fritz are very vocal about how they believe they were killed by the mob because Tom owed them money. And now she's saying that she knows this for a fact because Fritz is in the CIA. Is he now? Good for Hot him. twist. He is not in the CIA. <laughs> okay. You're, you uh, thought I was going to say he is. I know. I was like, holy shit. Y'all... And I hate to be slinging cool facts around, but our great aunt was in the CIA. And you know when we found that out? When she died. You the don't funeral. know when someone's in the CIA. That's why I said she knows that? I know. Now we're in March 1985. Susie and Fritz are now living together in an apartment in Greensboro, which is like 30 minutes from Winston-Salem. They also refer to each other as husband and wife. And okay. Fritz refers to Jim and John as his sons. Ew. Their paranoid, prepper-esque behavior is escalating. They hang camouflage blankets over their apartment windows. Fritz got a little inheritance from his dad, and with it, he bought a new Chevy Blazer, but most of it went to guns, knives, explosives. He, he bought oh my God. all the weaponry he needed. These poor boys. I know. Meanwhile, Susie is gearing up to go to court with Tom, who, again, is determined to get the boys back, and she finds out that her parents are going to testify on Tom's behalf. They're oh, like, wow. Sorry. Her parents are? Uh-huh. They see her spiraling. They don't like Fritz's influence. They don't like how the boys are living. So they're like, 
Sorry, girl. Tom needs to have those kids. Wow. Okay. Mm Mm-hmm. On May 17th, 1985, Fritz went to pick up his long... Stay with me here. Oh, God. Fritz went to pick up his longtime family friend's son, Ian Perkins, in Lexington, Virginia. Ian was a 21-year-old student at Washington and Lee. His dad and Fritz were lifelong friends. I believe they were neighbors. So Ian, Ian has known Fritz his entire life and really looked up to him. They shared a love of guns and hatred of communism. The purpose of Fritz's trip up there was to have Ian help him on a CIA mission. Oh, does Fritz think, does he think he's in the CIA? Does Fritz think he's in the CIA? Yeah. No. He's duping this kid. Oh. Because he's duping everyone. Because yeah. the mission was to kill foreign drug traffickers and the location was Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Oh, my God. Yeah. Young Ian's dream was to work for the CIA. So he was down for this. And Fritz told him that it was a tryout for his future with the CIA. Oh, He'd evaluate his performance after to, de- to determine if he would fit the bill. Oh, my God. So Ian was like, I won't let you down. You can't act like that was an unreasonable question for me to ask if Fritz thought that himself he was in the CIA. I bet he... Uh, he may have. Oh, well, and he may have, but there's a piece at the end that makes me know that he did not. Oh, okay. So so Fritz went up to Lexington to pick up Ian and drive him back for this mission in Winston-Salem. On May 18th, Ian dropped Fritz off in a neighborhood so he could complete the mission and then picked him back up like an hour later. Mission was complete. That's fucked up to do this poor college. Also, Ian, w is a good school. You should be a little bit brighter oh. than that. I know. I was wondering about that. I was like, how'd you get in there? How'd you get in there? Did you actually go there? I don't know. Yeah, we don't know. On May 19th, 1985, the next day, friends and family were trying to get in touch with Bob and Florence, Susie's parents, but they couldn't get through. They had been staying with Bob's mom, who they called Nana. Nana was 85 years old, and they didn't want her to be alone, so Bob and Florence actually went there a lot. They were with Nana all the time. Finally, Susie's brother Rob drove to Nana's house to see what was going on, and upon arrival, learned that a family friend had found all three of them dead. Oh, my all God. Shot. That's Susie's mom, dad, and grandmother. Yeah. But this was this after Susie's parents were like, mm, we're going to testify on, uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. She had found so out that they were Clear testifying. motive. Right. When Rob's wife, Alice, called Susie to tell her the devastating news, Susie was totally silent and was not at all shocked and actually said, quote, well, my dog has run off and I have to go find him. I'll talk to you later. Oh, God, you're an idiot. Parents and grandmother were murdered. What? Oh, my God. When detectives learned about Susie's former sister and mother-in-law being murdered a year before, Mm -hmm. and after talking to people who told them about her and Fritz's weird-ass behavior and relationship, they're like, let's go chat with these two. Right. Something is fishy here. Detectives went to Fritz and Susie's apartment for questioning. Susie was very cooperative and walked them through her entire day on both May 18th and May 19th. She, of course, mentioned Tom's shady business dealings and how she thought the mob or drug drug traffickers were behind both family murders. Sure, sure. They asked for Fritz's whereabouts, and he told me he was camping in Virginia with his friend's son, Ian. So they're like, oh, good. Let's go talk to Ian. Ian tells him the same thing. He was camping in Virginia with Fritz, but they turn up the heat a little bit and Ian just breaks down. He's like, don't worry, guys, I'm in the CIA. He said, I'm not supposed to tell anyone, not supposed to tell anyone this, but I was helping Fritz on a CIA mission. He said he drove Fritz to Winston-Salem to kill communists. He says the Russian KGB was involved. And the fact that the mission just so happened to take place the same weekend in the same town as Bob Florence and Nana's murders, just a coincidence. Oh, my God. Had nothing to do with the CIA mission. Mm -hmm. Got it. I only picture Andy Cohen saying, oh, sweetie. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) Oh, sweetie. That's what the detective said. They said, oh, sweetie. (laughs) You're in too far deep. What's going on? Yeah. They told him that Fritz was not the CIA. (laughs) He was absolutely duped. And they tell him that Fritz is the main suspect in these murders and the murders of Tom and Tom's sister and mom, Dolores and Janie. Mm -hmm. They convince Ian to wear a wire to help him get Fritz. So Ian agrees and meets up with Fritz on June 1st and June 2nd, 1985. Wearing a wire, he talks to him about the police interview. He asks Fritz if he had anything to do with the murders that night. Fritz maintains the CIA thing. I know you think 
you know where this is going. And for you know the people responsible, but the way it ends oh. is fat shit. Okay. Like there's no doubt that Fritz and Susie are responsible. Yeah. But well, I'm really it's looking a, forward to it. It's an ending like ending. unlike no other. Oh wow. Okay. All right. So Fritz on June third, Fritz picks up Ian. They're just driving around comparing notes about what they're saying to detectives during questioning. And Fritz promises Ian that he'll put it in writing that he duped Ian and that Ian was unknowingly participating in these murders. He thought he was on a CIA mission. So Fritz is saying to him, if it comes down to it, it's after a long conversation. He essentially just admits it. So he tells him, if it comes down to it, I will put a handwritten note somewhere and give it to him saying, you had nothing to do with this knowingly. I told you that we were in the CIA doing a mission, I duped you, you didn't know. You will not get in trouble. That's what he's saying. Is he admitting that he is lying? He's like, I lied to you. You just murdered people for no. He didn't murder anyone. Ian didn't. He just drove them. Fritz did the murdering. Ian just dropped them off. Oh, I thought Ian did it. That's why I was like, you're a real asshole. Mm -mm. Oh. Yeah, right. Ian's like, this little way, this 85-year-old is the the drug trafficking. (laughs) This one? Are we sure? (laughs) <laughs> no, he dropped the wrong off. house. He dropped him off and picked him up. He didn't oh. know what he was going to do. Oh, okay. But he yeah. is admitting now, like, I, I'm full of shit. I didn't, I'm not in the CIA. I don't know if he's totally he's admitting just it saying, yeah. or he's saying, I'll get you off the hook. Yeah, this will be worry. a front story. Don't worry about it. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know, really. Um, I didn't hear the tape. They're, to my knowledge, not available. But mm-hmm. I'm certain he knew he was not in the CIA. <laughs> This was enough for an arrest. Around 2 p.m., June 3rd, 1985, Fritz pulls up to the apartment and goes inside. Unbeknownst to him, massive amounts of state agents from both North Carolina and Kentucky were surrounding the place. Louisville agents, sorry, agents from Kentucky had actually come in town to question him about the lynch murders, and all this went down. So they're like, "Mm, join in Uh, on this arrest. Okay. So Kentucky and North Carolina state agents surrounding the place. However, there's a delay in busting in because they knew that Fritz was very unpredictable and they were worried that there may be a shootout in a crowded apartment complex. Oh, yeah. And they also couldn't evacuate the apartment building without Fritz and Susie noticing. Mm -hmm. So since all the agents were undercover, wearing civilian clothes and driving unmarked cars, they called for a uniformed Greensboro police officer to stand by in his squad car and act as a liaison during the arrest. I don't know why this helps alleviate some of the danger. Maybe they thought if Fritz saw at least one cop, he'd hesitate to shoot. Oh, uh, yeah. Or maybe there's some sort of legality behind having a local cop there since two different state agencies are involved. I don't know. Okay. But they decided they needed a local uniformed policeman there. <clears throat> I think it's mostly because it so it wouldn't look like civilians and whoever they thought was after them were busting right. in after them it will only feed into their mental illness they probably have a bomb to detonate the second they knew this was happening yeah they call in that request just before 2 40 p.m and officer tommy dennis responds that he's on his way that's a greensboro officer Mm -hmm. while they're waiting they watch fritz and Susie load up the chevy blazer with weapons camping supplies a couple of duffel bags Then, much to their surprise and concern, the two young boys, John and Jim, walk out of the apartment wearing camouflage. Oh, shit. This was a Monday, so they thought the boys were in school. Susie put them as well as their two dogs in the back seat. Susie gets in the passenger seat, and Fritz gets in the driver's seat, and they pull out of the apartment complex. The agents follow them, but they are scrambling. They're Mm -hmm. on regular cars. I think there are five of them. One's a Camaro. One's a Mustang. None have sirens or lights to pull him over yeah so they call it in to tommy dennis the local cop who was on his way to the apartment and tell him where fritz is because mm-hmm. he's still en route mm-hmm. tommy finds him and is hoping to stop him before he gets to a huge intersection which is like a hundred yards ahead of him mm-hmm. tommy flips on the blue lights whoop, whoop, the siren while another detective pulls his car in front of the blazer to block in fritz and an SB- sbi agent state bureau of investigation yeah Thank gets you. out, flashes his badge, and orders Fritz to stop. Fritz Shit. slowly pulls his car around the agents Shit. and bolts. Yeah. This would be the start of the most insane, <gasps> scariest, saddest police chase uh, I have ever heard. Oh, no. Now, several police cars, both marked and unmarked, are chasing him. 
He's not hauling ass. He's barely going over the speed limit. But again, they know he has weapons and kids are in the car. So they're being cautious. And how old are the kids now? Nine and 10. Mm, Poor buddies. So they're chasing him, but they're keeping a safe distance. Yeah. Officer Tommy gets neck and neck with the blazer. As he does, one of the other officers pulls into the road, I think from a side street, causing Tommy to skid against Fritz's driver's side door with his squad car. Oh, shit. So the squad car's windshield is facing Fritz's window. No. But Fritz still doesn't stop. In fact, Tommy looks up and sees that Fritz is pointing an Uzi at him. Oh, fuck. For those who may not know, some countries have much stricter gun laws, so you may not know. An Uzi is a submachine gun. Militaries use it. Civilians don't use it. It's... Mm -hmm. Legal in some states in the U.S. to have one. I think if they're grandfathered in. Yeah, there's like a a whole thing. It's not a black and white yes or no. Most In most scenarios, you cannot have one. This guy has one. Tommy immediately grabs his pistol. And when he and Fritz, he looks back up. And when he and Fritz make eye contact, again, merely feet away from each other, Fritz gives him a big smile and (gasps) fires five rounds into the squad car. Oh, God. The first three didn't break through it. But the last two did. One of them deflected off of Tommy's utility belt, and the other hit him in the upper right part of his chest. Wait, his utility belt? With his, like, his gun, his belt. Yeah, but he's sitting, he's driving? Yeah, it deflects off of it. Oh, my God. Luckily. Uzi didn't break the winch of the first three? No, well, they're very, squad cars are very bulletproof. They're designed for that, but not that. I mean, not that. I wouldn't think that. But two of them broke through. Two of them got through. Yeah. Okay. My God. Luckily, Tommy's wife always made him promise to wear his bulletproof vest every day he was on duty so that he was wearing it and that saved his life. But he said it it felt like he was getting hit with a sledgehammer and it absolutely shredded his chest and shoulder. Someone said later said that his shoulder looked like raw meat. Oh, God. Tommy's car slams to a stop, the squad car causing a few of the other cop cars to skid into each other. Yeah. But they keep going. Still following Fritz, a few of the unmarked cars are even in front of Fritz. Mm. So they've got him surrounded in every direction, but that doesn't deter Fritz because he then leans his body out of the driver's side window and starts firing. Yeah, he has an Uzi. Another officer, I think it was one of the Kentucky state agents, is hit under his right arm, but he survives. Jesus. He actually was pulling out his pistol and the bullet hit the pistol split in two and both hit under his arm oh my god now cops are returning fire and that busy intersection they were all trying to avoid is exactly where fritz led them oh north Carolina is a big state for us so i'm just throwing this out there if you're familiar with the greensboro area they're at the corner of friendly avenue and new garden road which is right by guilford college campus okay Bullets are flying everywhere. Glass is flying everywhere. Civilians are everywhere. Oh. People are pumping gas and diving behind their cars. People at the bank on the corner are taking cover. A woman mowing the college campus lawn dives off her tractor. (gasps) And reminder, most of these are regular cars, and it's not a high-speed chase. So everyone's like, what is going on? Yeah, Are these just lunatics? Like, glass breaking bullets. A machine gun is firing. They're like, who... What? What's happening? Meanwhile, the Greensboro dispatcher is calling all the local officers involved trying to get an update because the state agencies didn't inform them what was going on. They only told them they needed assistance with a felon suspect. They didn't know that he was armed and this dangerous. They they just said, we need a uniformed officer to oh come to the scene. Oh, my God. So they had no idea. So the dispatcher Holy, is like... They, oh, wanted for murder. Suspected for murder. He doesn't tell... They, no, they... they I think they knew it was a murder suspect, but they didn't know he was armed. They didn't yeah, know he had kids with them. Much. He didn't. Yeah. So the dispatcher is like, had do we need Uzi ambulances? Locked and loaded. Yeah. So the dispatcher is like, do we need ambulances? What car are we looking for to send out more cops? Oh which car is the suspect? Which car oh, are detectives? Yeah. We know a lot of guns are being fired. Tell us what the fuck's going on. Yeah. At one point, the radio signal is really bad, and she thinks they're pursuing the Mustang and Camaro, both of which are state agents. Oh, shit. Then it's communicated that Fritz is driving a Bronco, not a Blazer. No, that's OJ. (laughs) That was OJ 10 years later, nine years later. 
Then an innocent bystander in a blazer gets pulled over, is forced out of the car by officers with his, their guns drawn, only to realize it was the wrong blazer. Yeah. It is a shit show. Yeah, out there. this is chaos. Fritz turns left on New Garden Road, which is right by the campus. And at one point, the road has a very sharp left turn. Mm -hmm. So he's out of sight. But the agents are closely behind him. As the first agent makes the turn, he slams on his brakes because he sees that the blazers parked off to the side and Fritz is standing in the road, straddling the center line, just firing the Uzi. Holy shit. All the following cops slam on their brakes, bust out of their cars, returning fire. This is a college campus is right there. Oh, my God. When Fritz sees one of them pull out the AR-15, he jumps back in the blazer and bolts. Really? So, yeah. so now the cop with the AR-15 takes the lead in the pursuit. Yeah. I can't believe that intimidates him. He has explosives. Like, I'm the only his... one with semi-automatic weapons. Not yeah. You. Hey, that's not fair. Cops shouldn't have weapons like that. Sure. But in all this, Fritz never goes beyond 35 miles per hour. I guess he needs the car to remain somewhat in control while he's trying to drive and shoot a machine gun at the same time. Sure. So he, he's not speeding. Multitasking. Yeah. Fritz gets to a highway, still firing, and now they're in the small town just north of Greensboro called Summerfield, and the local police department there also starts pursuing. Oh, God, Again, they've never done this before. Yeah, and completely unknowing that this guy has an Uzi and kids are in the car. Oh. Uh. Local Summerfield deputies see the blazer, turn around to join in the chase, and as they make eyes with Fritz, he again flashes a huge smile and starts firing, and they radio in, he has an automatic weapon. <sighs> like, they're like, no, we know. No, no one we, told y'all? Sorry about that. Yeah, we know. He's shot it at several people. He keeps heading north, and they're pretty sure he's heading to his farm in Rockingham County, so they set up a, a roadblock on the county line. After one more turn, the blazer comes to pretty much a crawl, like his brake lights are on. Oh, He's almost completely stopped, and the pursuing cops stop and jump out, locked and loaded, ready to go, because they think Fritz is about to jump out and open fire again. Yeah. Just then, the blazer explodes, and when I say explodes, it disintegrates. <gasps> Debris flew more than 100 yards away in all directions. The passenger side door was lodged 50 feet up in a pine tree. Oh, oh, it was 3.07 p.m. So this chase was under 30 minutes long and it was so terrifying. Oh, my God. Cops slowly approached to see Susie and Fritz's bodies. Based on Susie's body, it was clear that the bomb was under the passenger seat. <gasps> the car seat was embedded in her. It was oh. like infused into her. Her legs were gone. The spring from the seat protruded from her pelvis. No. She was by far the most mutilated. Yeah. She was 39 years old. <gasps> Holy shit. Those poor boys. They go up to Fritz's body and are shocked to see that he is still breathing. No. So they start talking to him, hoping for a quick confession to the Lynch and Newsome murders. But he gurgles and dies. Oh, my he God. He takes a couple breaths and dies. He was 32 years old. The boys and the dogs are all dead, but the boys are rushed to the hospital for an autopsy, and it came back that both of them had cyanide in their system and had been shot in the head at close range. The shut medical examiner up. said that they did not die from the explosion. <gasps> they were shot just before the bomb went off by Susie, by the way. <gasps> she shot them, and they were very likely unconscious because of the cyanide. They oh. were 10 and 9 years old. Poor Tom. He is going to have to hear about, in addition to his mother and sister's murder, that his two babies were also murdered. At, yeah. Ugh, by the same monsters. Right. Ugh. The report of how the boys died actually made the office, all the officers who were involved in the chase feel a lot better because when they heard that the boys died of a gunshot to the head, they were worried it came from their guns. Was, <gasps> oh, God, they yeah. Were, everyone be firing rounds of bullets. Yeah. Oh. So they were like, and, when, and the first approaching officer who saw the boys thought he saw gunshots to, in the head. I mean, he was waiting for the autopsy to report that, but he was like, oh my but no, Susie God. did it. Don't worry, cops. Susie That's did it. That's confirmed? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So while the murders of Janie and Dolores Lynch, Nana and Bob and Florence Newsome were never brought to justice, they have no doubt about who was responsible and the cases were closed pretty much immediately. Ian Perkins, a 21-year-old w and student, was charged with accessory after the fact, and he was sentenced to four months in jail. 
After the chase, they searched Fritz and Susie's apartment, and Fritz had written the note saying Ian had no idea he was involved in this. Oh, he followed through. Followed through. Some detectives called it the worst moment of their entire careers. Tommy Dennis, the first one who was shot, quit the floor sat right after this, and he went mm-hmm. on to supervise the security at the county courthouse. Both Whatever boys were you bar- need to do. Good. Yeah. They said, he said at his family's insistence. He, oh, I'm sure. And I'm, I think he was like, that's fine by me. Mm-hmm. Both boys were buried in Albuquerque by Tom and Kathy. Oh. Tom said that they were absolutely not allowed to be buried in North Carolina. Tom and yeah. Kathy went on to have a daughter together, and I believe they're still married living in New Mexico. Good for them. Wow. Isn't that insane? That's, That's the story. Horrifying. Susie Newsom Lynch and her first cousin slash lover, Ew. Fritz Klinner. Disgusting. Ew. Oh, my God. Where did you hear that? I heard it forever ago on a small town murder. But then it came back up. A listener wrote in about it. And I was like, why do I know this? And I looked in our notes, our shared notes, and I had added it like a year ago. And I was like, mm. why did I add this? And I Googled it. I was like, oh, yeah, I remember this. Holy shit. I had never heard that. And so, so. I just, I, I got that. But I remember in all my research, it was like the Bitter Blood book. Get it. Because this is referred to as the Bitter Blood Murders. Jerry uh. Bledsoe wrote a book on it called Bitter Blood. So I just got the digital copy and just read it. And I was like, oh monsters isn't that insane yeah that's insane that was a good one okay so now patreon shout outs thank you for joining Brittany, maya claire lucy erica reagan melanie melinda samantha yatundi i hope i'm saying that right ashley clarine caitlin esha maria francis lauren Catherine, nikki l natalie imani cheryl janine's samantha ashton Lazy Pie, I hope I'm saying that right. Emily, Kaylee, Kennedy, Alyssa, Amanda, Kristen, Nacho, Kylie, Casey, Ashley, Julie. Wait a minute. Can we quit yet? <laughs> I swear. Are you serious? To God. I have notifications every time someone joins. I don't remember that many. <gasps> I do Thanks, too. y'all. God. Again, I also have two custom shout outs. Remember, if you're an $8 member on Patreon, that's our tier three. You get a custom shout out. So the first one's from Melanie. Hey guys, for my custom shout out, I would like to shout out Margaret Saving Grace Bully Rescue. They're they're a rescue local to me in Virginia that rescues dogs from all over. They do amazing work helping these dogs find homes and fosters to get them back in good health so that they can find their forever home. Oh, that's nice. They spend a lot in vet bills. So if you're an animal lover looking to give back, I highly recommend checking out their Facebook page. That's nice. So it's that, Margaret's Saving Grace Bully Rescue. That is so nice. And vet bills are so fucking expensive. The last custom shout out is from Reagan. My shout out is for my small biz. Okay, I love this. Love it. My shout out is for my small biz I share with my partner, Simone. We have a balloon decor business, Balloon Boss. We're located in Chattanooga, Tennessee, but travel as well. We've done installs in Nashville, Atlanta, Birmingham, and surrounding areas. Hi. Hi, what? Our, Insta- our Instagram is at we blow better. <laughs> Double entendre there. You better be careful. <laughs> we blow better. And our website is balloonboss423.com. I love this. Great. Give us That's a follow awesome. and don't hesitate to contact us for any and all balloon balloon needs to give your event that extra pop. We work hands-on with clients, even creating mock-ups to make sure your event is exactly what you want. Message us now and remember that hashtag we blow better <laughs> i love it i love that balloons really can make it your mm-hmm. event sure i've seen some impressive displays in my yeah. day. reagan i love that balloon balls 423.com awesome thank you oh, everyone it. y'all thank y'all so much you are the best people, people are the, the worst. worst bye bye